Hello everyone, it's daytime. I'm Buster the Fox, and today we're doing something a little bit different. This time, I'll be creating a tutorial on how to make your own custom scenario in Roller Coaster Tycoon 2. This was a video originally requested by Bobby Goyne on YouTube. That was three weeks ago. Yeah, sorry it took so long, Bobby. Anyway, let's cut right to the chase and get this tutorial started. To begin, find and click on the red toolbox button on the game's title screen, then select Scenario Editor. Once in the editor, our first task is to choose which rides and attractions we want to be able to build in our park. You do this by checking or unchecking the boxes next to each ride. Note, however, that you are limited to a maximum of 128 rides and attractions, so it's best to leave out rides that you don't see yourself building often. For instance, I never build canoe, so I'll uncheck that so I can use my selection for something I probably will build, like a chairlift. Also note that you should always uncheck the cash machine object if you will be creating a scenario where money is disabled. The cash machine is only used to allow guests to get more money when they've run out, but when there is no money, the game considers everything is free, so the guests will have no need to ever use one of these. Once you've decided which rides and attractions you want, move on to the footpath selection tool. This one's easy. As you can see, there are a total of 8 footpath types, but the game gives you a maximum of 16 choices, so you might as well just select the green tarmac and road selections and move on. They didn't put a whole lot of thought into that one, did they? Next, move on to the scenery selection tab. You'll notice this one has a maximum of 19, which, unlike the footpath, doesn't give you enough space to select every set there is. I would recommend selecting abstract for the cool glass items and the water feature theming for some useful, all-around scenery objects, but the rest is up to you to decide what kinds of things you think you would like to use in your own park. If you can't decide, check how many objects a certain theme includes. Then, just select the ones that have the most objects. That way you can make sure you're getting the most bang for your buck, so to speak. Next up is the park gate. You can only choose one of these, so make sure you pick one that you'll like before moving on. You have a choice between three types. The entrance building has a rounded top, and if you look closely, you can see the Six Flags logo on it. The entrance gates have a more minimal industrial look to them. Finally, the traditional park entrance returns from the original RCT game and looks like a castle spire. Moving on to the final tab, we get to choose what color of water we want in our park. There are a few choices here, two of them being green, but note once again that you're only able to choose one of these. If you just want to use normal blue water, you can leave this tab alone, but if you're going for a specific theme for your park, for instance the volcano, you might want to choose orange water since it looks like lava, or maybe use green water if you're going for an alien theme. Once you've decided on what you want in your park, it's finally time to move on to part two, the landscape editor. You can use this little box here to change the size of your park, but for this tutorial, we're gonna leave it at default. Instead, let's move on to what is probably the most time-consuming task of making a scenario, marking your land as owned. To get into this mode, click on the white sign icon on the map window. On the next screen, make sure the box for land owned is checked. To make this process faster, click on this little plus sign a few times until the grid stops getting bigger when you click on it. Next, I hope you're good at dragging your mouse cursor around, because we now have to mark every single square on the map by clicking. I'll meet you again after we finish this process. That sure took a while, but it's an important step because if you don't mark the land as owned by the park, you won't be able to build anything on that land once you've started your scenario. Also, it's normal to not be able to set the edges of your park as owned. You're going to need some space there anyway for telling the game where your guests are going to enter the park, so it's no big loss. The next thing you'll need to do is place some footpath leading from the edge of the park. These are to allow guests to enter the map. Next, you're going to need an entrance. You can place up to four of these anywhere in your park, but make sure they're facing in the right direction, or else your guests won't be able to go through them. Once you've placed your entrances, click on the guest icon. This will allow you to place a blue arrow, but only on a square that has footpath on it and is connected to the outside of the park. The direction the arrow is pointing indicates in which direction guests will be facing when they enter the park. 
Note that unlike entrances, you can only have up to two arrows, so make sure your paths are connected properly if you want more than two entrances. The final thing to remember is that all of the path leading into the park needs to be considered outside of the park. As it is now, guests will enter the map but won't be able to get past the fence. To fix this, click on the sign icon again, but this time, uncheck the Land Own selection before clicking. Now that we've set up our park entrances, feel free to add any decoration you like to the outside area. You won't be able to add or remove anything outside of the park once you start playing your scenario, so if you want to add scenery here, make sure to add it now. The hard part is over now, because once you're happy with your entrance area, it's time for part 3 of the scenario editor, the invention setup. This part is easy, just drag and drop everything from the lower window to the upper window. This makes it so that everything you've selected is available at the start of the game, instead of being unlocked slowly throughout the game like it usually is. Finally, we have part 5. You'll be met with an options window upon entering this segment. The first thing you're going to want to do is click on the checkbox where it says no money. What this does should be obvious. This is the magic button that turns your regular scenario into a sandbox. As for the rest of the tabs, they allow you to fine-tune your scenario's difficulty in specific ways. For a sandbox scenario, I think it's best to leave these at default settings. If you have any questions about them though, please leave a comment on this video and I'll do my best to give you an answer. Next, let's move on to the final step, the objective selector. To see your options, click on the first drop-down menu. You'll see you have four choices. Number of guests, build 10 roller coasters, build 10 long roller coasters, or finish building 5 coasters. Each of these objectives actually has another hidden requirement, and some of them will put you on a time limit, while another will just shut down your park if your park's rating gets too low. Therefore, the best choice for a sandbox scenario would be build 10 roller coasters, as the hidden requirement for that one is that all of the coasters need to have an excitement value of at least 6.0. This way, you have as much time as you want, and the game won't close your park. Next, click on the change button where it says park name if you want to name your park right away. You can change this later in game, so don't freak out if you save your scenario with a name you don't like. The scenario name option just under that is for changing what the scenario itself will be called, like Crazy Castle or Electric Fields. To make it easier to find, you could name it Sandbox, or you can name it whatever you want. The name doesn't really matter. Scenario group dictates where your scenario will appear on the scenario list on the title screen. If left on other scenarios, it'll be in the rightmost tab. The final thing you need to do before saving your new scenario is to add a description for it. This is unnecessary, but it makes it look better on the scenario list, so you might as well, right? Keep in mind that if you make a typo in a long description, you can easily hit the change button again and fix it without having to rewrite the whole thing. And that's it! All that's left is to save your scenario and you're all done. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment. Thank you for watching this tutorial, and until next time, goodbye everyone. It's night time. Say, uh, I just sit here, I chuck my harming potion at them and they will all die. Oh, I should probably go over the actual design of this thing, huh? Yeah, I forgot, I lost that footage. I went over this uh, once already, but... 20 feet to start and see how bad the intensity is on that. Um, put the entrance there and the exit there. Test it. Oh, that needs to be higher. 